Hey guys, welcome to the Summit Heights Fellowship broadcast. My name is Edward Crouch and I'm the lead pastor here at Summit Heights. And before we get to our broadcast, I just wanted to say thank you for joining us. If you have a few minutes today, check out our website, summitheightsfellowship.com and you'll learn all about our church. We have a great student ministry, an incredible children's ministry, preschool ministry, and we do small groups all over our community from Mineola to Quitman to Winsboro, Hawkins, even in Big Sandy. We would love to have you check us out one Sunday. If there's anything we could ever do for you, please take a few minutes, go to our website, fill out that prayer card on our website, and we would love to pray for you, reach out to you, or minister to you in any way we can. Again, thanks for joining us today. We hope you enjoy the broadcast. If there's any decisions or questions you have at the end of our broadcast, please reach out to us at our number on the screen or on our website. We would love to visit with you. Have a great day. Enjoy the broadcast. Good morning. How are you? Y'all glad to be here today? Cool. Hey, we got a lot of work to do. If you have your Bibles, turn to John chapter 13 or your apps. We're going to be there in just a moment. If you remember a couple of weeks ago, we started this new series on growing into maturity. And I, if you remember, I, I said that very first week that if we took 10 people and we lined them up and said, hey, what do you think a growing mature, growing mature Christian does? If we put 10 people across the room, we would get probably 10 different definitions and probably 10 different checklists. And there would be some things that would, would be the same in those, but there's a whole lot around this dialogue of what it means to be mature. And that's kind of what started this whole series about a year ago with our elders when we began asking the question of saying, hey, a church is not measured by how many people they seat, but how many people they send. And so we started asking the question about, hey, what does maturity look like? What does it mean to grow up? Because there's something as a parent, you want your kids to grow up, amen? You want them to move out? Can I get an amen? You want them to leave? And so uh, we, as we start thinking about Christianity and we start thinking about Jesus, we start thinking about what does it mean to grow up? up. And so we kind of went back and we started looking at this story of Jesus and where he was talking to his disciples. And John chapter 16, Jesus says, I've told you all of these things. And he's referencing back to what he has already said to them. And so you have to go all the way back to chapter 12 and you have to begin to ask the question, what was Jesus telling them? And what we know uh, when we got back and we looked at chapter 12, when we first started this series is that Jesus was knew that his time had come, that, that his time had come. He was about to head to the cross. And so we started looking at these different things. In fact, this acrostic is what we're kind of working through right now. Uh, so he talked about death to self. He talked about, hey, I, I'm not living for me. I'm living for the Father. And he's talking about telling them, hey, guys, if you want to follow me, then you got to die to self, crucify yourself. Then last week, we talked about imitation of Jesus, that to be a disciple of Jesus is to grow through imitation. We're all imitating somebody, something, some culture. So if you're going to be a disciple of Jesus, then you got to learn to imitate Jesus, to imitate him. And this week, we come to John chapter 13, where we're talking about serving others. In fact, I want to read this passage together with us today because we, like I said, we've got a lot of work to do this morning in, in scripture. And, and hopefully at the end, I want to apply this in a very practical way and invite you to be a part. So beginning in John 13, verse one, it says this, it was just before the Passover festival, Jesus knew that the hour had come for him to leave this world and go to the father. In other words, he's about to die. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. The evening meal was in progress and the devil had already prompted Judas, the son of Simon uh, Iscariot, to betray Jesus. And Jesus knew that the Father had put all things under his power and that he had come from God and was returning to God. 
So he got up from the mill, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. After that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with a towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. Peter said, no, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part with me. Well, then Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. You got to love Peter. Verse 10, Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. Their whole body is clean and you are clean, though not every one of you, for he knew that for he knew who was going to betray him. And that was why he said not everyone was clean. Verse 12, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to to his place. He says, do you understand what I've done to you? He asked them, you call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I am your teacher and your Lord, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I've set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. And very truly, I say to you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. What a great story that we, we all know. You probably grew up in church hearing about this story. In fact, I just got a question. How many of you guys have ever been in a church where they had a foot washing service where they brought somebody up on stage? You ever been a part of that? Yeah. You know, here's the one thing I know about washing feet. It's easy to wash clean feet. Amen. It's easy to wash clean feet because anytime there's a foot, and I, I've been a part of those and I love those. In fact, I remember the very first foot washing service I was a part of, I was like in junior high and uh, junior high feet don't smell good. And, uh, but as we got older and we did it as adults, you know, we would announce we're having a foot washing service. That means all the women went and got pedicures and all the men actually washed between their toes. And um, so it's easy to wash feet that are clean. What we're going to learn today is a couple of principles. And I, and I want to, I want to, you're going to see these principles over and over again, but see, Jesus knew that his time had come. Jesus knew his time had come because up to this point, all through the book of John, you would hear John say over and over again and Jesus say over and over again. In fact, you can go back and look at it in chapter two, chapter seven, verse, uh, chapter eight, that his hour had not yet come. As we learned just a couple of weeks ago that Jesus said, now my time has come. Now something has changed. Now something is shifting. Now it's fixing to take place and I'm gonna fulfill what I've done. And here's what I want you to understand about this whole scene of what's going on because Jesus knew his time was coming to be, to go back to the Father. In other words, I want you to understand this is on the eve of the crucifixion. This is on the eve where Jesus is gonna die. And he knew that. He was about to be crucified. It's very important because this whole event needs to be seen in that mind when you understand what Jesus knew was about to happen. Because up to this point, he said, my time's not come, my time's not come, my time's not come. And now all of a sudden, my time has come. And my time has come because I'm gonna die. I don't know about you. I don't know how you would feel about that. If someone walked up to you and said, tomorrow, you're gonna die. Okay, just keep that in mind as we go, okay? So we have see Jesus here as he's sitting down with his disciples, what we don't see Jesus doing is having a pity party. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. No, he's sitting down with a mill. He's not even upset for what you can tell. And see, here's the first principle I want to show you this morning about service is that simply this, no matter how bad things are going for us, you have no excuse not to serve others. No matter how bad it's going, think about Jesus. My time has come. I'm going to die. I am dying, okay, guys? I am going to be brutally murdered. And what did he do? No matter how bad things are, no matter how bad you have had it, there is no excuse. As a follower of Jesus Christ, and listen, if you're not saved in this room this morning, you can make all the excuses you want, okay? I'm talking to believers this morning. I'm talking about disciples this morning. I'm talking about growing into maturity. No matter what is going on or what is going on or what is about to happen in your journey, there's no excuse not to serve. Isn't it amazing how often we think people owe us? Do you know what's going on in my journey? Do you know what I'm going through right now? And yet here Jesus is, you just pick a problem. We get ourselves and we, we start looking at ourselves and, and we start thinking about everything that people should be doing for us. And the problem is, look at this statement on the screen. The problem is we have a natural tendency to be selfish and we need to be selfless. See, it goes all the way back to denying self. If we don't learn to deny ourselves, we're gonna be selfish, not selfless. 
See, these things kind of build on each other is that when we begin to struggle about, hey, no matter how bad things are going for us, we have no excuse for not serving others. The problem is, is we tend to be selfish. We haven't dealt with that death to self. We haven't dealt with the very first thing Jesus told them is that we must crucify the flesh. What is the reason Christ was not feeling sorry for himself? I, I want you to look what he says. What did he know? He said, knowing he was about to die, knowing that he was about to die. No, it says knowing he's about to go to his father, knowing he was about to go to his father, knowing that he was about to return to his father. I'm sure that Jesus knew this wasn't gonna be pleasant. I'm sure that he knew that, hey, tomorrow, everything's about to change over the next few days. This is not gonna be a fun ride. It was not a good part, but he was going to be with his father. That's what he was focusing on. He was focusing on what's going to happen. That, hey, yeah, I'm gonna die, but guess where? I'm gonna be with the Father. I'm going back. That phrase, I'm going to the Father. See, Jesus knew he was going to the Father, but he loved his men. He loved his followers. He loved them greatly. He says, having loved them to the end in verse one. In other words, he had loved them completely. And what Christ was about to do as he washed their feet, he was demonstrating his complete love for them. But one of the things I noticed about this is Jesus lived above the circumstances. Because really, there's a couple of things going on in this passage. There's there's some tension in this passage because you see Jesus at this meal and he's washing their feet. But we also see at this meal, there is one there who is about to betray Jesus. There's one there. His name is Judas. The scripture says, and what it tells us is that Judas had already planned to betray Christ. And here's the amazing thing. Think about this for a minute. Just stop for a minute. Look at me. Jesus knew it, and he didn't stop him from serving. It didn't stop Jesus from serving. Think about this for a minute. He already knew that Judas had betrayed him. And as Jesus went around to wash their feet, he didn't skip Judas. He served him. See, here's the second principle. The first principle is simply this. No matter how bad things are going for us, we have no excuse for not serving others. But principle number two, the presence of evil does not hinder love. The presence of evil does not hinder love. You see, the evil was directed at Christ. But notice that Jesus didn't blow up Judas. (laughs) Because that's what we want to do, isn't it? I know his motive. I know her motive. I I just know. I read it right there on Facebook. I know their motive. I can see their eyes in their rearview mirror. They're, They're going slow on purpose, right? And see, those are petty things. But life has a lot deeper things, don't they? This is a lot deeper moment here with Judas, about to blow up, about to, he's already sold Jesus out and how easy it would be for Jesus to just blow him up. See, our reaction to evil in the world and evil that is done to us, the whole deal for us is Jesus continued in his actions and his attitudes and for many of us, we react to what's done to us and it'd been so easy for Jesus just to react in that except Jesus responded in love. He responded in love. See, many of us use our environment as an excuse for our problems. We use our environment. We use people around us. See, you you and I are the way we are because how we react to our environment, good or bad. You are where you are because of the decisions you've made in your journey. You can't blame somebody else. It's how you've responded to those, those circumstances, those people. You see, we see Christ living above the circumstances. Even though Jesus knew Judas was in the room, he still washed his feet. He lived above his circumstances. He acted right above all others. And see, that's a whole nother deal about maturity is knowing when the the room is not right, knowing when people's motives are not right is still loving them, living above your circumstances. Verse three continues to tell us why Jesus was able. It says, knowing, first knowing I think this is significant because intellectually we know it's true, but many of us don't believe who we are in Christ. Jesus knew who he was. Jesus knew something. He knew who he was and he based his actions based on what he knew. He knew that the Father had given him all things into his hands, that God had given him everything. In fact, Ephesians 1.22 says, and God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church. Christ counted on something that hadn't actually taken place yet. He was counting on something that God was gonna complete in him. He was about to go to the death on the cross and he was counting on God to raise him from the dead and to give him everything because God had already given him everything. 
You see, the enemy was still out and causing problems. But we don't see Jesus sitting there going, but, but dad, I thought you were gonna take care of this. Dad, I thought you were gonna go do this. No, he was there. He knew that God had promised to take care of it all. Right. And his timing. And Jesus wasn't worried about it. But even though our circumstances weren't exactly in his favor, he acted or responded like they were in his favor. He was moving in faith. He was moving to show us that even when circumstances aren't right, that the Father has given everything into his hands. And he also knew that he had come from God and was going back to God. Jesus had no identity crisis. Jesus knew where he came from and he knew where he was going back. He had no identity crisis. It gave him incredible freedom to serve. See, when you know who you are and you know where you're from and you know where you're going, all of a sudden there's an incredible freedom to be who you are. <laughs> Too many of us are afraid of what others think. Our self-image is formed by what others' opinions are. But see, simply put, a biblical self-image simply means you know who you are and you are secure and valuable because God loves you. Right. Not because others like you or think highly of you. See, a a healthy biblical self-image doesn't care what other people think. Right. It only cares what God says. Now, we do need to care what other people think and how we respond to them. We're going to see in just a moment. So don't get cavalier there and just say, I don't give a crap what you think. Okay? Because that's where we go, isn't it? Sorry, I, I know some of you don't like when I say that word, but um, that's where we go, isn't it? Well, hey, I don't care what people think. I look, only matters what God thinks. Well, that's also prideful, okay? When you start living that way at the expense of other people. We're going to see that in just a minute. See, Jesus loved his disciples. But I want you to see what happened. Notice in verse 4, it says Jesus rose from the supper. And it's significant because normally, I want you to realize what's going on here. Normally, when, when you show up at someone's house in Jesus' day, there was a servant there that washed your feet as soon as you came in. Because I don't know if you know about this, but feet covered only by sandals on dirt roads get really nasty. And so the last thing you want to do is recline at a table with someone's dirty feet in your face. Come on, get a picture. How many of you have done that, right? I mean, we all get it in our living room sometimes when we take our shoes off. And we have a teenager, a preteen, and a, and a young man in our home. And, and all of a sudden, we all take our shoes off. Come on. And all of a, it's like all, it hits us all at once, Right? It's like, everybody go wash your feet. So here Jesus is, they're reclining at the table, and it says that he rose from the supper. In other words, they were already into the meal. And it's kind of interesting that they're already into the meal because it almost as if Jesus was wondering, I wonder if any of the other disciples are going to do this. I wonder if they're going to do it. And instead, Jesus gets up right in the middle of it and goes, well, since nobody else is going to do it, I'll do it. He took on the job of a servant. And that attitude wasn't going, nobody else is going to do it. I might as well go ahead. Anybody else do that at your house? Job, work, church. Isn't that what we do? Notice Jesus doesn't do that. There's not an explosion going on. He just gladly gets up and does it. But I think it also shows that the disciples were way too proud to do it. That every one of those men knew sitting around that table that feet needed to be washed. And I just wonder if Jesus was sitting back and going, I wonder if these guys have gotten it yet. I wonder, I wonder if they get it. I wonder if they really have arrived here yet, and yet they hadn't. They just stayed there. So Jesus gets up from the supper, and he lays aside his garments. And here's this attitude. In other words, Jesus lays aside what, what, what kind of defined him as a, as a rabbi, as a teacher, and he lays it aside, and he puts it down, and he takes on the form of a servant, and he begins to wash their feet. The ultimate thing that Jesus laid aside. In fact, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8, look at this. He says, have this same attitude in yourselves, which is also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself. He, he, he removed those garments, taking the form of a bond servant and being made in the likeness of men and being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. See, Christ never gave up his equality with God. He chose to put it aside for a moment to take on this role of a servant. It's an incredible saying. He submitted himself to the will of the Father. And even though functionally he was God, he laid that aside to become a servant. 
Listen to me. Jesus, again, going back to that deny self, he's going all the way back to that maturity thing that we've been talking about, is he over and over again keeps ex exhibiting this. See, the disciples also were, in essence, equal to one another, but they were unwilling to become functionally inferior. They were equal, just as Jesus was equal with God, and he was willing to submit himself to God and become a servant. The disciples were equal, and yet all of them sat around the table, all too proud to do what Jesus demonstrated to them. It's an incredible scene. We see their basic attitude is selfish, and yet Christ's attitude was selfless. He girded himself, he put on a servant's apron, and although he was superior to them, he laid aside and demonstrated to them, this is what it means to serve. Can I just tell you this? Jesus is laying out this powerful message here. Now let's go back to the story. In verse six of chapter 13, I wanna read this again to you, look at it. Because he comes to Simon. You gotta love Simon, don't you? You gotta love Peter. I mean, Peter just takes everything literal. I, I don't know why I like him so much, but um, probably because, anyway. Um, yeah, you know. Verse six, he came to Simon Peter. He said to him, Lord, are you, are you gonna wash my feet? Jesus replied, you don't realize what I'm doing, but later you'll understand. No, said Peter, you'll never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, son, you have no part of me. Then the Lord, Simon Peter replied, not just my feet. Here are my hands. And here's my head as well. It's almost arrogant, you know. I'm glad I don't suffer from that. Um, yeah, you laugh. Um, Jesus answered, those who have had a bath need only to wash their feet. The whole body is clean. And you are clean, though not every one of you. For he knew who was going to betray him. And that is why he said not every one of them. See, Jesus here is not just talking about feet. He's not just talking about the physical body. Don't miss this. Look at me. Don't miss this. You, you got to see this because Jesus is talking about having a clean heart. That's right, He's talking about something deeper here. See, the, the disciples didn't get it at the moment, just like some of us don't get it in the moment. They thought they were getting their feet washed because that was a tradition of what they do in their, in their, in their time. But Jesus is going, there's something bigger going on here, guys. There's something bigger going on here. I'm, I, this, this word in the Greek text, it literally means for wash. It means to wash. And so there's really two baths that Jesus is talking about here. There's two washings that Jesus is talking about here. One is the bath of regeneration. That's our salvation. That, that this happens when we're saved, when we come to recognize that we're sinners, that you and I are, have sin in our life and sin separates us. And when we acknowledge that we are sinners and we, we confess that sin and repent of that sin and we invite Jesus Christ to be the Lord of our life, then he cleanses us from head to toe. The whole body is cleansed. There's nothing left in us that's sinful. There's nothing left in us that's not been regenerated. All of us are clean inside and out. Now don't miss what I'm about to say here, okay? I'm telling you, Jesus says, guys, you're going to miss this. You're not going to understand this, Peter. And see, Peter's like going, well, if you're going to wash my feet, go ahead and wash the whole thing. Jesus is going, you've already been washed. You've already been washed. See, the second spiritual washing that Jesus is talking about is that continual confessing of sin. And see, we miss this sometimes because we're just going, well, let's, let, let me take those boots off and wash your feet. Let me tell you, oh, you got shoes on. Let me, because we don't understand the significance of what Jesus was doing. And Jesus was showing them, listen to me, man, you are sinners. And, and when you receive me as your savior, I wash everything inside and out. You are clean. Right. As we live in this world, as 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just forgives of our sins. See, as we wash our feet, the whole body doesn't need to be cleansed. We confess our sins. That daily washing of confession, because when you're out in the world and you're rubbing up against people, which you should be, Okay you're going to get dirty. Not purposely. There's a difference of just doing life and going through life. There's a whole other thing of jumping into a pig pen. Amen. Listen, don't wrestle with a pig. You'll get dirty and the pig will enjoy it. Amen. Yeah. That's why Jesus said that the one who has bathed has been saved. He's only to wash his feet, and confess his sin. But there should be something in us as a growing believer that we confess our sins because we've been saved and you are clean. But he says, not all of you, because he's talking about Judas here. Judas hadn't had a bath. He didn't believe that Christ was the savior. We'll come back to that in the conclusion today. But see, then Christ sits down and he begins to explain all he's done. 
and why he did what he did. And, and the question comes in is, how does this relate to us? As we think about maturity and we think about uh, what it means to grow in maturity, what does this mean? Well, the most obvious application is, is that we're to serve others. We're to serve others, to do what Christ did, to imitate Jesus to, by serving others. And I think this shows us how we're to relate to the world. In spite of our problems, in spite of everything that's going on and all the evil around us, he's still calling us to serve one another and serve the world. The problem is we react wrongly. We're selfish. It's all about us. And you can't wash somebody else's feet when it's all about you. And we'll try to manipulate those around us to, so we don't get hurt again. Yet Jesus is teaching these two principles. Go back to them. I want you to see these. That no matter how bad things are going for us, we have no excuse for not serving others. Principle two, the presence of evil does not hinder love. Listen, if you get these two things down, we're going to see at the end of this passage, Jesus said, if you do this, you'll be blessed. Everybody say blessed. blessed. We want to be blessed, don't we? Then listen to me. No matter how bad things are right now. <laughs> You have no excuse for not serving her. Jesus was about to die. He knew it. Listen, if you had 24 hours to live, how many of you would moan and groan all day long? I guarantee you it'd be a few hours, wouldn't it? You'd be calling everybody, this isn't fair, this isn't right. The presence of evil doesn't hinder love. Judas was in the room, man. How many of us want to blow that guy up? See, many of us, view Christianity as just having our own relationship with God. We don't even think about other people because we're selfish. I read this week that many of us go to church on Sundays like we go to the movies. We walk in, we nod to other people, we get our Coke, we get our popcorn, we go sit in a dark room, and we don't talk to anybody. Ouch. Well, listen, if you're not close to people, you can't obey what Jesus said. Right. To wash someone's feet requires pretty close personal contact. He didn't say, provide the basin and the water. Here's a towel, wash your own feet. Didn't say that, did he? That's easier, isn't it? That's a whole lot easier. Wash your own dadgum feet. <laughs> I don't like feet. I, in fact, I don't know anybody. My wife's been begging me for years to go get a pedicure with her. I'm like, no. I don't like people to touch my feet. I'm being serious. Don't touch my feet. Don't like it. It's, yeah. Anybody else with me? Yes, thank you, all the men, yes. I know some of you guys, anyway, anyway. Um, <laughs> she says I love it, I'm just not willing, okay? He said to wash one another's feet. See, that's getting a little too close for comfort, isn't it? The problem is in verse 35, jump down to John chapter 13, verse 35. Look what Jesus says, by all of this, men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. If you love one another. So this act of washing one another's feet is a picture of the love that we should have for one another. You see, the whole main idea is Jesus commands us to wash one another's feet. To wash one another's feet. In fact, I would state it this way. Look at the screen. Washing one another's feet is a ministry of forgiveness, cleansing, refreshment, and humble service. You see, washing one another's feet is is a ministry of forgiveness. In Ephesians 4, 31 and 32, Paul commands, get rid of all bitterness, rage, anger, brawling, slander, along with every form of malice, and be kind and tenderhearted, forgiving each other just as Christ has forgiven you. See, we simply extend the forgiveness that God gave us to others, and we wash their feet by doing so, by forgiving those who harm us, that we root out all bitterness, Root out all bitterness. Can I say that again? We root out all bitterness, malice. <laughs> to root it out and forgive them. Well, they haven't asked, Ed. Then go ahead and root it out now that when they do, you can freely give. Go ahead and root it out now so when they, if they, if they never do, then it won't control you. But if they do come back, then it's all rooted out and you can simply, humbly wash their feet. To root it out, he says. It's a ministry of forgiveness. Number two, washing one another's feet is a ministry of cleansing. Paul in Ephesians chapter five says that Jesus literally cleanses us by the washing of the word. The washing of the word. That we are to wash one another in the word of God. 
In fact, he's using it in context, men. Listen to me, married men. Listen to me, young single guys that want to get married. And one of these things you want to get married, the way you love your wife is the way Christ loved the church. And the way Christ loved the church is to wash her with the word, that we're to do the same thing for our wives and our girlfriends, to wash them in the world, word of God. And let me can I just say this to you, single guys, you can't wash your wife, your future wife or your girlfriend in the word of God while you're having sex with them. Can I say that? Aren't you glad you came? Well, we hadn't done it all the way. Well, where, where's the line of sin? Ouch. I know. I just made some of you mad. See, someone pointed out this week when you wash someone's feet with the water of the word, make sure the temperature's right. Amen. Because the last thing you want to do is wash somebody's feet with scalding hot water. And see, some of us just want to blow people up, don't we? We just want to blow them up. Take that moment. Blow them up, man. That'd be easy for Judas, wouldn't it? I bet, I bet Jesus wanted to go out and warm that water up a little bit more when they got to Judas. Put your foot in this, big boy. I know what you did. That's why Paul says that we're to restore in a spirit of gentleness. Don't blast someone with the word. And I just say this the reason some of your friends don't want anything to do with your Jesus is you're just blasting them all the time on Facebook. Just blasting them, man. Just blast, and they're not even saved, and you're blasting them with the word of God. Love them, man. Love them. And listen, if they do love Jesus, they have a relationship with Jesus, restore them gently. Don't blast them, wash them. Remember that baby? Remember parents when you had that baby and that infant? How gentle you were with that baby as you bathed her, you bathed him. That's the way we're to treat one another in gentleness. It's a ministry of forgiveness, of cleansing, but it's a ministry of refreshment. When you come off those dusty roads, there's nothing better than having your feet washed, I bet. If your feet are dirty and having someone just wash your feet and get all that grime and all that stuff off. Just be able to wash that up. First Corinthians, Paul says, for... They have refreshed my spirit. And yours, talking about three men that came to hell. In Philemon chapter one, verse seven, it says, the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. You ever been around someone like that? That every time you're around them, they're so in tune with God. It's just refreshing to be around them. You walk away going, dude, I love that guy. I, love, I, I, I could spend all day with him. Because they're just so refreshing, man. They're not down in the mouth. They're not always talking about how bad things are. They're just, man, they're here to refresh you. Amen. Do people feel refreshed around you? Or when they see you coming, they're like, oh, crap. I know, uncomfortable laugh, wasn't it? Ugh. See, washing one another's feet is a ministry of forgiveness and cleansing and refreshing. And lastly, washing one another's feet is a ministry of humble service. See, having a fish washing ceremony where you wash already clean feet is easy. But Jesus' command here is to wash one another's dirty, smelly feet. That ain't easy. He meant that sometimes it's going to be those unpleasant tasks, those things that we think are beneath us. Well, I've arrived, Edward, and I don't do that anymore. Huh. Let me get practical for you, Okay. See, one of the practical ways you can practice this, washing others' smelly, dirty feet, it's just here on Sundays when you walk across this campus, if there's trash on the ground, bend down and pick it up. And some of you go, well, we have a custodian. We do, and she works hard. It's incredible. She does a great job. But what keeps us from walking over a piece of trash that we think's beneath us? Well, I didn't put it there. I hear that in my house all the time. I didn't do it. I don't care. Amen? Amen. I'll just do it with you. Yeah. So we don't clap on that, do we? I didn't do it. How about at the end of youth service, you students in the room, and I'm looking at a few of you, how about at the end of the youth service on Wednesday night, you stick around and help Dave empty the trash cans? Well, we have a custodian. We do. She does a great job. But you created the mess. Whoa. And listen, before you get on our kids too hard, how about these trash cans that overflow by the uh, coffee pot in the Sunday mornings? Well, that's not my job. Really? 
<laughs> Getting close, isn't it? <laughs> Told you we're going to get practical. Here's another way. How about you park out in the uh, back 40 and leave these close parking spots for somebody that needs them? We used to, uh, I, I, I hate to even confess this, but um, I used to go to Walmart and I'd always look for that front parking place. Anybody with me? Yeah. And I'd drive around longer than it took me to find a parking place than to go in and get out. Amen? Just to look at that front parking place. And I, and I started dating Danielle. This was 20 years ago, 18 years ago, something like that. I started dating Danielle and we'd get to a Walmart or some academy or Bass Pro, whatever. And she would say, hey, just park way out here. I was like, no. She goes, look, big boy, be grateful you have legs. If you want to date me, you park way out here. I parked way out there <laughs> and walked. And then the whole time we're walking in, she's picking up buggies. I'm like, that ain't, ah, that's somebody's job you're taking away. She goes, get over it. I'm pushing buggies. You see, I think this thing gets real practical because when Jesus was talking about there's some of those things that we just don't want to do, he's calling us to. This whole ministry of forgiving and cleansing and refreshing and just humble service. Can, can I just get real practical? Because Summit Heights has environments where people are coming to be refreshed. There, there's a couple of environments I want to mention this morning and challenge you. One is our student ministry. And can, can just everybody look at me. Look at me right here. Just look at me. Men, specifically look at me. One of the things we need desperately right now, and, and I've, I've prayed about this for weeks now, having done student ministry before David, our new youth pastor, came a year ago, we desperately need men to sit down on Wednesday night and refresh our young men. Because we don't have any. We've got very few. There's about 100 different students that show up on Wednesday night. We've got plenty of ladies loving on girls. We need strong men that would be willing to come on Wednesday night and meet with these young men so that David's not always the one guy up on stage. We've got a few other guys that show up. But I, I, I just would challenge you. go, well, I don't know if I want to do that. Listen, sometimes there's forgiveness, cleansing, refreshment, and there's humble service. You know, Joe said a couple of weeks ago that if you're over the age of 50, then this is no longer designed for you. You're now building for the next generation. And by the way, I'm right there with you, okay? And that kind of hurt for a minute when I realized, oh, snap, he just talked about me. And I don't feel that. So the next generation are these young men that come on Wednesday night. Can I, can I just lay that challenge out to you guys to get with my youth pastor, David Bright, who is a phenomenal young man but needs help with some men on Wednesday night? Would you be willing to pray about that and just step up? Wash the feet of these young men. Just serve them on Wednesday night. You'll find out there's some really cool young men in our, in our ministry. They're phenomenal. Here's the second area. Our children in preschool ministry. I, I see Nikki, our former preschool pastor here. And, and I saw, Me, there's Meg back there, our former preschool pastor, before they moved off and came back home and got saved and came back to Texas, amen. <laughs> I don't think there's ever a Sunday that our preschool ministry doesn't need volunteers, servants, to wash the feet of those little babies, to wash the feet of those children. And can I just tell you, when you're serving in there, you're also washing the feet of the moms and dads that are sitting in this room. Right. I'm telling you, man. Yeah. You're washing. Yeah, I remember when Danielle and I first had our first child, we were in the hospital and, and the church where we were attending sent us a letter, said, welcome to parenthood. You now have a new baby and we've signed you up to now serve in the nursery. We weren't even out of the hospital. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, oh, hmm. I couldn't get out of the hospital quick enough to go meet my pastor. I took the letter and threw it on his desk and said, you can take me off that list. Because the last thing my wife needs right now in just having a baby is to have to come in and now start serving just because she has a child. And we made it a point here at Summit, we will never do that. You want to know why? Because there are people who already have babies and they're old enough now that they have been refreshed. Now they can refresh these new moms so they can come in here. Yeah. I'm telling you, it's huge. It's huge. The message you sent. Listen, can I just challenge you? Men and women can serve on Sunday mornings. Attend one, serve one. 
Attend one and serve one. Your hands were full a while ago with that little baby, amen? I've been running all over you like a jungle gym. Where's that baby now? She's back there, amen? Yeah. Pick up one of these. You can download this. In fact, put that big screen on it. Look at that. Serve catalog. Y'all know what a catalog is? Go shopping. Come on, go shopping. Go find you something to serve, all right? I know I'm, I'm belaboring this. Listen to me. Jesus said this in verse 17. Look at it. He says this in verse 17. Now that you know these things, you'll be blessed. Everybody say blessed. blessed. You'll be blessed if you do them. If you do them. See, the goal is that we put knowledge into practice to serve. And if we'll put knowledge into practice and serve, Jesus says, you will be blessed. That word blessed literally has a connotation. You'll be happy. Anybody want to be happy? Because I'm happy. Yep. Okay. Serve. Now, let me close up and we'll go home. Okay. Listen, Jesus cleansed us from our sins because of his death on the cross. It's our salvation is the reason why we serve Jesus. Simply because he cleansed us. He bought us with his blood. But Jesus makes an exception to his commandment in verse 18. Look at it. John chapter 13, verse 18 says, I'm not referring to all of you. He's talking about Judas. I don't want you to miss this. He said, I know that I have chosen. I know those that I have chosen. But this is to fulfill the passage of scripture found in Psalms 41, verse 9. He who shared my bread has turned against me. Talking about Judas. Listen, Judas had seen the miracles. He had been a part of Jesus' journey. He had even been there when Jesus healed people. He was there when Jesus washed their feet. Jesus washed his feet outwardly. But Judas wasn't clean all over. Listen to me, just like Judas. Don't miss this. Look at me, just like Judas. Every one of us in this room could be closely associated with Jesus and his followers. You can even serve in the ministry and yet you've never had Jesus cleanse you of your sins. It sort of moves some of you right now. And you can do all these things. Think about Judas. Judas walked with Jesus, lived with Jesus, handled all the money of Jesus for three years and yet at the very end, the dude was not saved because he had never came to the point with his dirty heart and said, Lord, I need you to wash me. I trust in you as the God of human flesh who died on the cross for my sins. Can I just say this for you, some of you in this room? You can wash feet, you can serve, but all those things won't get you there. Only through the washing of Jesus Christ are we regenerated and made new. That's it. And then a response to that is that we serve others. Right. Amen? Yeah. See, he's not your Savior, your Lord, and your teacher until you've experienced salvation yeah. that only Jesus can give. And I don't care how long you've been coming to church. I'm glad you're here, by the way. But this, that, this doesn't save you, even if you sit on the front row, okay? <laughs> I, I know, I know. I spit all over the top of your bald head. It still doesn't get you <laughs> saved, amen? It's only through a relationship with Jesus through a confession of your sins that you're saved. And then the response is, you serve. No matter your circumstances, who cares if evil's in the room? You serve. You wash feet. Amen? That's what growing disciples do. So let me pray for you. So Lord, I love you. And I thank you for today. I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, you didn't just want us to exist. You wanted us to grow. That's why you told us all these things. And all these things so far is that we deny ourselves, we imitate you, and we serve like you. So God, I pray as we leave this room today that, God, we walk out of this room and we, <laughs> we learn what it means to serve others. That, God, we refresh people. That we cleanse them. That we forgive them. And God, I pray that it's a re, just a response of what you've done in us by forgiving us and cleansing us, refreshing us and serving us, that God, we would then imitate you and do that this week. God, I pray for men that will rise up and just take the challenge to love on some young men on Wednesday night, for men and women that would maybe take the challenge to attend one service and serve the other one, and our children in preschool, just, just simple steps of humble service. God, help us. Give us courage.
God, I pray that every week that you'd give us courage. We're pretty selfish people, so God, help us be selfless. Give us courage as we walk out of this room and serve others. God, I pray if there's somebody here, just like Judas, that's been around this all their life, yet have never given their life to you, give them the courage at this moment to confess their sins, to repent, and invite you to be the Lord of their life. So Lord, I love you. Thank you for Jesus. And we ask it all in his powerful and beautiful name, Jesus Christ of Nazareth. And everybody said, amen. Hey guys, welcome back. We hope you enjoyed the broadcast today. And if there's any decision you felt like God is leading you to make today, we would encourage you to uh, make that decision and to go online. There's a prayer tab on our website that you can go to. We'd love to pray for you. We would also love for you, if you accepted Christ today, to send us a text. We have a number at the bottom of the screen that you can text us the word accept if you accepted Christ, or if you would like to know more about baptism, just shoot us a text with the word baptize to that number on the screen and we'll get to you, I promise you. Hey, have a great day and listen, if you're looking for a great church and you don't have a church home, come visit us one Sunday. We have two services, one nine, one at 11. We'd love to see you. Have a great week.